We're back. The Foul Life Podcast, another episode brought to you by our friends at Gerber Gear Stay Sharp America. As a matter of fact, I didn't get to participate just now, but I had some close friends using Gerber to cut the meat off of wild turkeys in Georgia. We were lucky enough to get on them and stay on them and put them in the grease. We've been down there with uh, Mossy Pond Hunch. Y'all need to get down there and check out the lodge. It's an incredible place. And those knives went right through the breast meat like butter. And I'm talking fried turkey. I'm talking bacon-wrapped turkey skewers brought to you by the provider in Gerber. They were amazing. Stay Sharp America, we carry Gerbers in our toolbox, our lunchbox, our deck systems, our trucks, our UTVs, our boats, our blind bags. Always got to have a sharp edge. Keep that sharp edge. Today's episode of the Fowley Podcast is also brought to you by our friends at Mossy Pond Retrievers and Mossy Pond Hunt, Southern Georgia. That's where Axel came from. You've seen Axel all over the foul life, and you've seen the owner and founder of Mossy Pond Retrievers, Mr. Brad Arrington, all over episodes of the Foul Life podcast and the Foul Life TV on the Outdoor Channel. And we had an amazing experience down at his place the last few days, and that's why he's going to be one of our guests today. You've heard him here before. I apologize if you need to go get an interpreter, but just watch the bouncing ball at the bottom of the screen. You will pick up some of the words he says and i got a story to tell about this and it's funny i tell it to everybody that i go to but last october this man dropped off my dog axel to me in nevada and he went over all the commands and hand signals and how to get him to do this and how to get him to do that and when brad left i couldn't get axel to do any of them and then i figured out why and it was because he would say instead of me i'd go here but brad said here so Axel had no idea what I was saying. And once I finally realized that and started talking like Brad, but now when I hunt with Axel, I have to sound like I'm from Southern Georgia every time. Yeah, sit, sit. Brad Arrington, welcome back. (laughs) Thanks for the amazing introduction there, building. (laughs) My brother does it so much better, but Clay will be like, come here, you son of a bitch. Everybody here in Georgia, buddy, they've got a uh, different, everywhere you go, everybody's got a different sound. There's a, definitely a unique sound down here for sure. That's Bobby Johnson, Nashville, Tennessee. He's been down here. Bobby, what do you think of this place? Man, I've, uh, you called me there at the last minute to come on down, and, and I don't want to leave. I wish I didn't have to leave. And you made me stay an extra day when I got to get a turkey on the ground yesterday, and I'm glad I did that. But I've got to get back home and um, – get back to the Nashville grind of doing things there and doing a little bush hogging business and then doing the music business and I got my hands in a lot of things right now so I've got to get back and get back on track and then y'all turn right around and come back to Nashville so I'm going to see y'all again and we've got some entertaining to do and um, I enjoyed uh, southeast Georgia I will tell you this that turkeys are a little bit different here they uh, get I've been blessed to hunt them from Kansas to Florida to Tennessee and uh these turkeys, boy, they shuck and jive you like uh, like they got on Rolexes and toting cell phones, man. They they see a truck a mile away and they duck and they're gone. They, they don't they don't give you time, but uh, they're real keen. It's uh, hard to kill a bird here. I agree. Why is that, Brad? I'm not sure. We um, you know, with all our guests coming in that turkey hunt all over the country, we 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 hear that a lot, but. Um, We've been pretty successful. Most um, all groups that come in at least get to shoot, um, but they they are very skittish. They're they're hard to they're hard to hunt. Um, they don't show their faces very often. But um, I'm I'm tickled to death. Both of you guys got to kill one, and Hunter Hunter pulled it off for us. So he did. Hunter does a great job. Man. He's good He's, at it. He's got a way. He's, he's got a language with him. He, he he understands them in these these pines and these little swamp heads. We walked a little swamp thing yesterday, just me and him, a big circle in there. And I'd never seen anything like it. I, you know, I've been in Florida and swamps there, and, and this this black water that was in this, I called it a cypress head in there. 
Boy, it was the prettiest thing I'd seen in a long time in there. It was almost like it was a medicine. You just kind of needed it. It was different. And turkey tracks everywhere. And you go, man, these turkeys walk through this water. They walk through this mud. Those swamp birds there. I mean, they definitely, they're, high, they're high stepping through there. What, why is it that you just don't see a lot of them together? A lot of other states I go to, you see, you know, more concentration of turkeys. It seems here like, I mean, you go to a farm, there'll be one or two toms and a hen from what I saw. And Hunter kind of backed that up that a lot in this part of Georgia, it's not big numbers. It's just that you get in there and you try to get on that one or two birds in that farm. Does that sound about right? Oh, yeah. Our, our turkey population is way down. Um, you know, when I was in high school, uh, I graduated in 02. If you killed a turkey, I mean, that was a big deal. But there weren't many people turkey hunting. And then probably 10 years after that, it seems like everybody was turkey hunting and we were we were full of birds. I mean, every field you went by, there was there was birds. And now, I think, I guess, because everybody's hunting, the population is way down. They're actually shortening our season in Georgia this year. Um, I guess um, they're, they're seeing it as well, DNR. But um, the, the numbers are way down from what I've witnessed, we've been guiding for turkey hunts for probably six or seven years now. And um, I can tell you that the numbers are down. We only, we used to take, we used to do maybe 20 kills. Now this year we only booked 15 kills. So um, it's the, the numbers are down. Do you think that they're gonna end up doing something with the limit too? Cause it's a pretty liberal limit for non-resident and resident you can kill three birds each per year. So you might see that go down a little bit too? I would suggest it if somebody asked me. I mean, we 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 know the numbers and hunt as hard as anybody in the state probably. I mean, we we, we stay after them and um, I would definitely I would definitely bring the numbers down if if we want the population. To. How many birds can you kill in Tennessee? It, well, last year it was 4. This year they changed it to 3, which is good. Um Kansas, I know, in all the years I've been hunting there, it's only been two. You can only kill two. Yeah, Kansas, too. And, uh, I, you know, Kansas, places like Kansas and Iowa, you know, getting off the subject of turkey, deer-wise, you know, with it only being one deer, you know, they changed. Tennessee used to be you could kill three bucks, and now you can kill two bucks. And I think changing that, you know, God knows how many deer and turkey are killed that aren't tagged god bless those people for doing the things that, that they do but you think about the deer population and the turkey population if you shorten that up a little bit you're going to get a lot less birds killed and you're going to get more birds made because there's more birds out there doing it one thing one thing we do here hunter and i just agreed on and we tell our guests is a lot of people will double up on a on a hunt um and you know, this is definitely not DNR, but this is something they could do because if you turkey hunt a lot, if there's two or three mature birds together, if you shoot one, the other two are running right to him while he's flopping. So everybody says, I doubled up. But if there's two birds together, you're going to double up. I mean, last year we shot a bird, stood up, was walking to the bird flopping, and the other mature bird was still fighting him. But, you know, um, that I think that's something DNR could go to is, you know, only one harvest per day per person because so many people double up on these birds. And they think it – and it, it is cool, but what we've witnessed is we come back to the lodge and it would have been a lot more exciting for that, that guy or that guest if they had have shot one today, then go back and experience the whole hunt again um, as opposed to bam, bam, and them, them killing two back-to-back -back right there. But – if there's a mature bird that can see another mature bird get shot, he's running to him. I mean, if anybody's turkey hunting, that, that's what's what do you going mean? On. What do you define mature as? A two, gobbler, not a jake. Over yeah. two years old? Yes, sir. Yes. That's one thing I noticed. You know, Nashville, right there in Tennessee where we hunt, you can only kill one bird a day. And that was my first question coming yeah, here. Yeah, I like that. When I came here, that, that, that was my first question. I asked Hunter when we got in the truck, I was like, how many birds a day? I know you can kill three birds, but can you kill more than one bird a day? He said, you can kill them all three in the same day if you want to. Yep. And I was like, well, that's kind of weird because you can only do, you know, Kansas, we, you we, can kill we two. Don't, we don't hear at Mossy Pond. We, we, we ask our guests, shoot one. If there's another one, let him go and let that be a whole other experience. Mm -hmm. And after you explained it a little bit to them, 
they 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 understand but most people <laughs> you hear all the time people doubling up and tripling up i mean there could be three mature birds and you shoot one we had one a couple years ago we couldn't work this bird couldn't work this bird i mean i pulled out all the tricks well while we were working him a bird just came out of the swamp and came to us um when we weren't even working so the guest shot him the second he shot him we're getting up getting all our stuff up we're gonna walk out there. the bird come out of strut from 300 yards away left his two hands ran all the way across the field and was flogging that bird while while we were walking to him and we we'd been working him all morning this was 11 a.m really? we couldn't get him to do nothing but that other bird flopping like that i don't know what it is it they can't stand it that's crazy they just and it's you see it all the time and i i kind of agree with what you're saying that you know if you got it's very rare that i've ever sat up sat on a turkey stand with another gun you know what i'm saying like in duck hunting you always are in the blind with three four or five buddies but I don't know if I've ever really done it much with two guns in the same turkey stand. We and do it quite a bit. We do it quite a bit back home. It, you know, normally it's a, you know, I get to hunt a lot by myself because I get up in the morning and go hunt before work. So I don't, bu you know, bug nobody else. But a lot of times we'll sit together like, you know, me and my brother will do it. Um, me and another guy, Jeff, will go hunt, but we'll set up in different spots. Like he'll get on one end of the field, I'll get on the other end of the field. So it's, you know, if one gets the flock of birds, great if the other guy gets a flock of birds great but we i guess we don't do it as much as you know just sitting side by side hoping to double up we don't ever go thinking oh we're gonna double up today uh, we just don't try to do is that. there a difference in doubling up like the way that errington's explaining it is you shoot one he's flopping around and you see it all the time that other mature bird gets in there and just starts kicking the heck out of him because now he's dominating him but what if two come in together, like they're both tricked and they're both coming to that to fight a Jake or something, and you go one, two, three? Boom. Is that the same thing? Or you're saying you want the whole with experience two, with two guns? I, I, you're just talking one guy yeah, shooting two. Just, yeah, just one guy shooting two. You know, but having two guns in there, that there wouldn't be anything wrong with that. If you had been, you know, when you're scouting, you see two mature birds running together. You know, you could you could do that, and I would say that would be that would be cool, fun, and. Knock two birds yeah, out with one stone, literally. That's a fun double up for sure. You get the shoot on three, one, two. That's right. Two. Um, but that that's what I was when we booked this hunt. That's what I was worried about. Is um, I know every time I've hunted with you in the past, you you shoot so much better when all your friends are shooting building. Um, and you having to shoot by yourself <laughs> on this turkey? Are you hunt. trying to? Are you, is this? Kind of, <laughs> I was worried how we were going to pull how uh, a show off with you shooting by yourself because um, you're trying to make a joke about me shooting a shotgun. Is this what you're trying to say? <laughs> no, I, I just made a joke about you shooting a shotgun. That's exactly <laughs> what just happened. You know damn well that I'm the best you've ever seen, right? <sighs> I have had to work a dog a time or two and put my shotgun down, and then I was like, oh, guys. And the, all the camera guys look and like, we, what just happened on that last volley? And I'm like, I'm sorry, I had to work the dog. So now you know. I got to shoot my birds and pick them up. And when I'm picking them up, I have my gun down. And so I want to get this right. So let's say that somebody at Benelli is listening to this. Mm -hmm. You're going to say to that person at Benelli that, Chad does not represent their brand good by shooting their gun so poorly. Is that what you're saying? I tell you, y'all are hard on each other, man. We all hard on each other when we're all together and we're, and we're just, you know, having fun. But he, he makes fun of two, me a lot. Two, three days I was here, I could tell y'all are. You guys are like brothers almost. You know, y'all pretty hard on each other. I'm not on him. Uh, I don't know. I haven't said both anything. ways. Didn't we start this podcast by him making fun of me right out of the gate? <laughs> I mean, didn't even introduce me um, without starting to poke and prod. <laughs> What'd you think of the food, Bobby? It was amazing. Everything. Mr. Lowe did some cooking back here, buddy. We every night we had. Last night I think was my favorite with a little Low Country boil and oh my gosh, fried grits, shrimp and boil cheese shrimp. grits. That was good. Low is a Stud. Not that I ain't fat already, but I'd be real fat if I had to be here every week. Lowe gets after it. He does. He dialed us in on so many good meals. That fried quail recipe, that mossy pond southern fried quail, mm -hmm. 
it's almost like eating squirrel, kind of squirrel, and uh, a mix between squirrel and frog legs. It's a lot of work. You, you got to watch the bones. You just compare squirrel to quail? I love squirrel. I'm just talking about the overall experience. You got a lot mm-hmm. of bones, and it's a lot of work for a little bit of meat, but every bite is awesome. You agree or so not? So good, yeah. It's like crawfish, right? They're a lot of work for a little tiny morsel of meat. You see yeah. Cajuns eat crawfish. They go through them like Kobayashi on hot dogs at the Nathan's Competent. You can do that too? Oh, yeah. You suck the head? Uh, not not every single one. I mean, I do you when you eat crawfish? Do you I do don't. That? Do you eat crawfish at all? We don't get them much here. Do you but, ever? Uh, when, you ever? when I go out that way, I do. I love them. Do you suck the head when you eat them? No. Never? Mm-mm. Yeah, I do once, like one every eight to ten crawfish. But yeah, Lo, man, he's awesome yeah he is you hit a home run with that dude yep and yeah, then there's job. and then there's Joni. <laughs> <laughs> then there's Joni. uh-huh Joni. Joni won't, won't, she, she, won't let your cup go she empty. is awesome too she could be my favorite human being i've ever met she's great she, she is so positive country country positive she's just neat is she gonna be here tonight yes sir yes. <sighs> i'll make my thursday or is it wednesday what is is it tuesday it is Wednesday. I never know what day it is. I got to be in. We Jackson killed turkeys Dillard. on a Wednesday today? We you did, did too this morning. That's kind of cool. Smoked them. You saw the kill shot, head shot, just bap. Bap, bap. Great shot. Why are you laughing? <laughs> <laughs> when turkeys do a back flip, that means you miss the head. No, that's not true. I mean, if you shoot the head, the head may wiggle but not the whole body this turkey on film did a back flip why is he being hard on me again bobby i killed that thing he never moved he had the muscle. To, he had to have shot it right in the breast to make the whole body do a back flip really we'll see when we're eating tonight i, I think the you pellets know. bounced off the ground and came back up and got the bird like a ricochet like a boom. like I, a skipping a rock you, i tell you what those gerber knives had to be tough all that uh, <laughs> lead that we were cutting through when we breast them out earlier that was i'm TSS. gonna say this so that tss i mean you know, i shot Ooh, that's some, i shot the same gun you like that gun yeah and that thing put the smack down seven to nine tss three inch were they are nice buddy what do you think about bobby Johnson songwriting and singing, Brad. Whew, that was my favorite part. I mean, I, I love music. I mean, there's nowhere, anything throughout my day that music hitting around. Uh, I love music. So to have Mr. Bobby play by the fire right here at Mossy Pond was, was really special to me and everybody here at Mossy Pond that was able to enjoy it. And I just extremely, extremely talented. Thank what you. was your favorite song? Can you pick one? Um, what was it? I don't know the actual name. Um, Too Wet to Burn. Mm-hmm. Is that it? The Bridge Too Wet the, to Burn. It's on a long, long time ago. It's been probably, I think, all my friends have that's the one they were probably, probably request most yeah. out here. And it's crazy that that song and Horses in Heaven are not heard by the masses. Whew. They all ought to be on the big radio. Thank you, buddy. Horses in Heaven. Who Garth Brooks would make that. A, you should be on there singing it. Horses in heaven. We have fun. It's it, it's always fun to try them songs on new folks too. You know, coming here and getting to play for. I I call it a naked ear. You know, nobody's ever heard those some of them songs I played last night, and then to get their reaction off of it, it makes it. It's almost like you just wrote them yesterday. You know, when you get new folks to hear them, it's it's fun. And I love music, man. I've always loved music since I was little, and and you know, moving to Nashville, and you know, life goes. 10 different ways and you know being in the music business is still right where i'm at um you know you know going to nashville to be a superstar changed with the fact of how nashville works and then i had to work too you know i had to get a job i had to make money had to couldn't run around trying to write songs all day long i had to eat and had to have a place to live and and that's what you know a lot of people get caught up in that as, as far as nashville goes and so many great talented people in nashville i mean Half of our friends, you know, Chad, you've gotten to do some great podcasts with some talented people, you know, Brent Cobb and Leith Lofton. And the list is long. It's gotten longer the past few years of all the folks you've gotten with and got to meet. And a lot of friends through Ben Ratliff and, and 
there's so many talented people. We've got a place there in Nashville we go up to, Larry Hawkins' place, and it's up in Greenbrier. And it seems like everybody goes up there at certain times of the week or certain times. And I see people that I hadn't ever met before, and we somehow we get to talk about Larry Hawkins' place. And it's a place where everybody kind of goes and congregates. And we've met a lot of great people up there, a lot of friends. And Ben goes up there quite a bit. And um, a lot of talented people in Nashville, very blessed to be have a bunch of them in my corral and, and, and friends and, you know, folks I can book and write with. And and every year somebody new comes to town and you learn, man, this this is a new young blood, good music. This, I love trying to help people too. All, all the, you know, I'm 46 years old, going to be going to be 46 October 10th. But some of these younger folks come to town, I like to try to help them from what I've learned in the years I've been there. I wish I knew then what I know now, you know what I mean? It'd be a different story, be a different outcome. And uh but I'm happy where I'm at. I'm very happy with uh songwriting, still getting to write songs with great people and coming up with something creative and, and good to the ears. Always rewarding surprise. So you come on a trip like this and probably find inspiration, yeah? I do, absolutely do. We uh like would Brad inspire you to write a song about him at all? Well, Brad would be a short one. Well, no, it'd be a, it'd be a. You could make a novel out of it, or you could do a short story. Now I'll tell you one that you'd write a song about, and it would just be fast and a number one hit. And it'd be Hunter Boatwright. Now he Boatwright. Is, he is something. We get to chit chatting and talking, and at first, you know, when you first meet him, he's kind of quiet and. You get you get to know him and you kind of learn some things. You learn a little bit about Southeast Georgia. That's he sure. started off real quiet too, and yeah. then he got he's kind of gotten that. Oh yeah, he's, now he's, he's not as shy anymore. Now he's talking about your toe. <laughs> <laughs> Man, my toe. Oh dang! I was lucky enough for Brad to get me into a doctor's appointment with a family friend. X-ray, broken toe, with arthritis setting into the joint. They put a needle down yeah. in that thing and just lit me. You, you, is that bringing back bad memories, Brad? You've had that needle in your toe, huh? Man, I wish I would have been in there. <laughs> I, I'd, have, I'd have stirred that like we stir our biscuits here at Mossy Pond. <laughs> it hurts my feelings just to sit right here and look at it. I mean, I'd have took, I mean, I'd look I'd have took that, that needle and just wiggled it all You would have just did a witch's oh, brew just like you were brew. doing a gumbo? Just it actually like, looks a little better than it did earlier. It, earlier it looked like it was literally going to pop. I mean, look at that thing. Well, I, I'm not. She said, "Stay off of it." And, and the first went, thing I do is go turkey hunting. And you just, had to follow Hunter boat ride. And I stayed woods. right up with him. I was actually moonwalking so and looking yourself. at him, trying to keep up with me. I was way out in front <laughs> yeah, of him. Right. I'm serious. So, Brad, tell us about this new endeavor out here. This was Mossy Pond's a kennel dog. You know, world class dog training. You can bring a duck dog here. You can get obedience. You can get. A, you can bring any kind of dog here, really. But now you're offering hunt packages for hogs, upland game, quail and pheasant. You're offering duck hunts over water, over decoys, boat blinds, boat rides, um, deer hunts, turkey hunts. The, uh, a, a corporate group, a, a family group, whatever, can now book a hunt with Mossy Pond, right? That's correct. Um, we. I noticed I'd send these dogs home and I'd call the owners just to follow up and check up on them and go over their commands. And I would I, I would find out that they said, Brad, you know, the dog's doing great um, in the training out in the yard, but I just don't have any place to hunt. People struggle with getting invited to dove shoots and, you know, duck hunting so tough in South Georgia. You got to go out west and um, they would only have one or, trip, one or two trips if they – uh, scheduled a year if they swung and missed um, so I, I started inviting guys out I said look you'll pay me it'll be part of your dog training but come out and we'll hunt together we always put them up here at the lodge at the end of their training program and teach them how to operate the dog you know we'll start in the yard and then do a simulated hunt do all the obedience in the lodge with them but um, I said it'll just be part of the deal I'll, I'll do a little hunt with you we have a big pen right here at Mossy Pond that um, holds our ducks for us, our pheasant, and we'd just go turn some ducks out and um, put the guy and his dog halfway between where we turn them out and back to the pen and shoot a few down. Um, so it'd be a simulated hunt, use ground force blind, use um, 
some boats, use dog stands, stuff like that, and try to simulate a hunt. Well, after I started doing it, um, some of their friends would call back and said, hey, can we come back and shoot some ducks like that? And we did that for a few years. Um, there's actually a blind right in front of um, the lodge, and we would do it right here in front of the lodge. But everybody understood what it was. It was just a, you know, just to work your dog. And when these people started calling wanting hunts, you know, that's when we we purchased a, another piece of property um, adjoining us that gives us 1,100 continuous acres. And um, we've been guiding, you know, off and on for probably – eight to ten years now but the in the last two years we really got serious we picked up this bigger piece of property three years ago and we're we're trying to do a lot of hunts and it started off with the dog customers because like you said we we train all kind of dogs with flushers pointers retrievers but um now we we do open our hunts to the public and whether you have a dog or you don't you know, we still take pride in our dogs that we work and perform in front of the people um, when we're hunting. But everything that we, every, all, all the hunts except the turkey hunts, we do involve dogs. Um, the hog hunts, the deer hunts. Um, we actually have um, permits here that we actually um, can do dog hunting with the deer. We, um, what, what our main focus is, is the ducks and the quail and the pheasant though. With the ducks, you know, one of the things about duck hunting is it's federally regulated with the migration routes, and, you know, it's a federally regulated bird like the dove is. Um, you look at you look at a duck hunt, you're going to have your daily limit, which you do here, um, but these are this is called plantation hunting. So I want to make sure that the listeners understand that you – get a dog trained by Brad or Lee or anybody out here at the, the Mossy Pond crew, it's a great idea to be able to bring a dog and simulate that, whether it's before the season starts or during the season, it might be a slow migration in a state. You can come here and have your dog that you've invested so much in, you know, pick up a hundred ducks in a weekend. So, but you also don't have to have a dog trained here to book a hunt here. So explain to me the ideology or the thought, the mindset of a plantation style hunt to me, I look at it like it's legal, it's ethical because you're going to eat the ducks, but you're also getting shooting practice in, you're getting camaraderie and fun at a lodge, team building, it could be a corporate event. Do you have to have a dog here to do it? Or I'm sure that I could book a hunt here and not bring a dog, but you're going to supply a, a world-class lab for us to have on our hunt anyway, right? That's correct. You know, at first, when we first did these right here in front of the lodge, you know, I would even kind of turn my nose up at it. You know, this isn't realistic. It's, it's only training. But we pride ourselves in our hunt in our hunting to simulate it. At, I mean, there's quail plantations all over the country that, I mean, shoot 300,000 quail a, a season. And um, and we, we shoot a lot of quail here, shoot a lot of ducks, but we pride ourselves in making that hunt as realistic as wild hunting as possible and if you didn't know you were in south georgia we go out on the buggies we get in a, a boat we go out in the boat we hide in the timber the birds are not the ducks are not trained to go see we raise these birds all year for our hunting season we don't just bring them in the day of they're raised on the farm in the swamp there is a roosting pond there's a feeding pond and these ducks, I mean, it's as realistic as you can get. If you didn't know you were in South Georgia, you, and I took you out there, you would think it was wild birds. They, they get up, um, they spook. If you're, if you're not hid well, if the hide isn't right, um, they, they decoy, they um, come to calling. I mean, they, it, it's as wild as possible. And just like our quail hunts, you know, some people do it different, and it's all about shooting, 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 but our, our quail hunts, we want it as realistic as wild bird hunting as possible. Our pheasant hunts, we um, we do the same thing with them. It, you know, you have your flusher out there, just like out Midwest, and um, they 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 flush the birds. So everything we do, even though it is plantation hunting, um, and and we had to proof it over the years. These duck hunts, I consulted on several different um, properties 
here locally and all the way up in Connecticut on private farms of people that had dogs trained where they would have one pond where they housed the birds with, uh, with a pen on that pond. They would catch them, go to a, you know, a thousand yards away, release them and let them fly over a different pond. Um, and the only thing with, with that, I mean, the birds came the same way every time and it, and it worked and it's good work for your dogs. But the way that we have it now, we have, um, three or four different, um, roost ponds. We have four or five different places that they feed. So if they miss that one spot that they're, that they're feeding at, or you're there and you're hunting, they just go to another spot. So they're constantly working. You never know which direction they're coming from. Um, so your decoy spread, where you hunt, what time of day it is, you have to take all these elements um, in, when, you're, when you're setting up, just like if you're wild bird hunting. And that's, that's what we try to provide here, a wild bird hunt. But <laughs> here, here's, the, here's the, the best part. We never missed a limit this year. Never. Started October 15th and got done last week. Every person that came killed their limit. Every day. Every day. So do you see the hunters, and Bobby, I'm going to ask you this real quick, is these are plantation ducks. They're not wild ducks that migrated here, right? They're raised here. It's simulating a real hunt. Is there anything wrong with a group of friends out of Atlanta to drive down here, come over here from Nashville, Tennessee, and I ask you that because in this country, one of the big things and big push right now is growing deer, raising deer, antler growth, high fence deer. There's places all over this country, South Texas, Michigan, all over Ohio that are offering world-class deer hunts where 300 inch deer are getting killed behind a high fence. But these high fence units are thousands and thousands of acres to where that deer may or may not have ever seen a fence. Is there anything wrong with high fence deer hunting, whether you enjoy it personally or not? Ethically, is it okay? And what is your views on something like coming down here with a group of buddies and enjoying this hunt and seeing great dog work, eating great food, having great lodge life and camp life camaraderie? What do you think about all that? Well, there's, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. It was like he said a little bit earlier, you know, you, he, a lot of these dogs that he's trained for people and they go back home and a lot of guys don't have any place to hunt. They don't have places to go. They don't have a place to enjoy that. And, you know, there's so many, well, this whole, this whole hunting industry is a, you know, from, from the big stores to the, the small stores to the, everybody wants to hunt. Everybody sees what goes along with hunting and, and getting out and the, you know, you know, getting out in the wild, having a nice shotgun, having a nice bow and arrow, getting to go hunt. And it's gotten so competitive that any land that's worth hunting or has any good hunting on it is taken by somebody. Somebody's leasing it. Somebody's, somebody has it. I'm, I constantly, where I'm at there in Tennessee, there's places that I've had permission to hunt for years, and it's because I'm kind of a caretaker for those places I've some of them will have some cattle. We got to make sure we take care of the cows. And some of the people can't, you know, they live far away. They can't get there. There's always somebody down there trying to figure out who owns this property. How much can I pay to come in here and hunt it for the year? Everybody's looking for a place to hunt. So I don't see anything wrong with, you know, the duck hunting scene here, the high fence. The, and it's all in how you look at it, you know, where you go. You know, a lot of high fences in Texas that I know of. I've been to a high fence in Texas. I enjoy going. Will I shoot a deer? I, absolutely I will, especially if it's somebody that, that I like the fact of, hey, man, this deer here, he's been here for six years. He's seven years old. We need him gone. We have some other deer that are coming in, and I like that aspect of the hunt. I can't shoot one that's 280 inches that walks by me three times. I've got to shoot this one particular deer that someone told me they want gone from the farm. To me, that's a, that's a hunt. I've accomplished something by whether it's high fence or not. So I don't see anything wrong with high fence or anything with what is going on here with, you know, the way you explained your duck pond, I didn't realize that was actually going on here. But I think that's great. I think it's a cool thing because it keeps, you know, there's a lot of people, like I said, can't, can't find a place to duck hunt. Go. And, you know, we, I train for some of the best duck hunters in our country. I mean, um, a lot of the guide services use us to build their dogs because they – they want good dogs working to recover those cripples and recover their birds. And 
I, I, I can see it from both sides if, if somebody, but what I've noticed, what's surprising, I can see it from both sides, but what's surprising, a lot of our owners that have leases in Arkansas and have leases in um, North Dakota, South Dakota, Iowa, they'll have a dog trained with me. And I mean, they've spent hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars on that lease, but when they're striking out at, out there, they still come here and hunt. They come here, they have a professional dog trainer that's in the blind with them, helping them with their dog, um, getting them, telling them how to correct the dog without the dog getting a sour attitude. It's just like the questions that you ask me, Chad, about Axel. And I mean, you duck hunt every day. And um, there's still questions that are going to pop up, even for the most advanced um, duck hunter out there when handling his dog with all the other stuff going on so you have a professional dog trainer right there with you while you're while you're duck hunting and you're guaranteed a limit you you get to kill the birds the birds are working and it gets those dogs watching the birds looking up and like chad said a group comes in here friday saturday sunday and you kill 20 30 a day a morning for him for two or three days i mean that dog I mean, in three days, he's he's ready to rock and roll. I mean, he's he's getting seasoned fast. Tune, tune back up. And that's right. It's I think awesome, it, right? I think it's awesome, and I would be that guy that initially would have been like, "Oh, come on, are you kidding me?" I would. But yesterday, riding around and seeing it, I was like, "I'm in." Yeah, like I'm in, days. and I and I and I've been under thousands of wild mallards in cornfields in North Dakota on the Yellowstone River in Montana, Peafield in Alberta, Saskatchewan, or Ontario. I mean, I'm not saying rah, rah, but I've seen it. And then when you come down here, you're in Georgia, you're in a different part of the country that's simulated, but it's still with, with a cause, right? You're getting something out of it. And it's real, realistic, right? We, we were in the blind yesterday, Bobby, and ducks flew over my head and all I could do is visualize me and spinning them and seeing them orange feet drop down and start working over, you know, whether you got a mojo in there or a bunch of green head gear decoys. But I mean, I, I, I completely are in favor of it. And if people have an issue with it, it's something about educating yourself on it of why it's being done. And, and you, you would really enjoy it if you gave it a chance. Well, the, the, the past two days from the time I got here, you know, I, I know there's a lot that goes into training dogs, but I've learned so much just by absorbing, coming in and out of it, you know, us going to different properties and chasing turkeys the past two days, coming back here to the lodge and seeing these guys out here in different spots and areas working with these dogs and, you know, stop, stop for a minute and watch them just to see what they're doing and how they're working these dogs. And there's a lot that goes into it. And it's very, uh, very detailed. I learned a lot just by watching some of those guys and, and to see these dogs work. It's amazing. I mean, it's so awesome. And there's nothing cooler in the, no. whole, in the whole world of hunting. There's nothing, whether it's a pointer, whether it's a duck dog, whether it's a, a hog dog, whether it's a bear dog, a cougar dog. I've seen dogs, you know, go six, seven hours and I don't 20, 30 miles in hills chasing mountain lions for predator management. The, the dogs are just the coolest part of the entire hunting deal in my opinion and i know that somebody would say well going to africa and shooting planes game or the dangerous five or going after a big sheep in british columbia or northwest territories to me watching a dog honor another dog on a quail hunt or a chucker hunt in the rim rocks in northern nevada or idaho or seeing axel or or smooth or one of these dogs down here do what they're doing it's incredible to know how smart they truly are when they're trained right <clears throat> which brings me to my next point in question I have become very critical of dogs since I met you, Brad. I don't know if you hear that from a lot of friends, but I don't have a, a long fuse anymore with a bad dog or an annoying dog or a dog that whines. And is it wrong to call a dog annoying? Is there such thing as a bad dog? Is it the, the owner's fault for not getting it trained right That's because that I dog never had a chance? That it's not the dog, but it's it, not the dog's I, fault. I don't have a lot of patience being around that. Am I wrong to think like that when I'm around? so many good dogs being around you now well it's just you know we get spoiled we we know what their capabilities are and when i mean it's just like inside you know in in the lodge in here you know we we have a place board and we tell the dog to go over in place when we're when we're eating or when we're, but then at the same time the dog will come over here and let us love on it and be a gentleman um around us and a pleasure to be around but if we're if we're on the 
floor, um, tearing a gun down and putting it back together and cleaning it. I mean, the dog's not in our lap. He's not jumping off. I mean, he's obedient. And um, just like you and my other customers and myself, you know, we're spoiled. We're spoiled by a good dog. But no, I don't. I don't get irritated with the dog if I if if and when I see that. I just I know that I hate it for the dog because he wasn't given the opportunity that these others have and the, the owner didn't and you know most people just don't know have the knowledge they don't know how good a good dog can be and they there's good dogs that are terrible out there because the owner just thinks that and you know and they've never seen it they um you know they haven't they haven't seen a dog trained to that level so that's what they expect that's what they've been around that's what they grew up on so that that's all they know but yes i'm i'm with you when you when you're around good dogs it it spoils you it really does like it really does well we do have to say goodbye for this podcast now and here's why you have to go shoot a yukonuba dog tip in a vortex series of dog tips for some upcoming blogs we're doing the vortex you have to get to the airport, or unless you want to stay another night. Me and Brad, we're going to try to talk you into it. I can't do it, buddy. You had me stay last night, and I'm glad I did. I don't, we but you did say that ground. I forced you to, or I made you, did. you. Well, you held my head on the ground and put a boot on it with that big, nasty toe. Oh, yeah. that big, nasty toe. <laughs> 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 Man, I just gave no, up I'm right there, stayed, Bobby. Yeah. She got hammer time on her toes. <laughs> I want to thank you guys. I'm Brad, I want to thank you. Thank you for having me here as a guest, man. Man, when... Chad, thank you for calling me last minute to come hunt turkeys in southeast Georgia. I'd never dreamed I was going to be here until, what, Thursday or Friday. And uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I've learned a lot. I've met some new friends. And uh, that's what it's all about at the end of the day. I, I got so dang great. excited yesterday for that bird coming in there. And it's, I said, you know what? And when that when that excitement's gone and, and, and I don't ever get excited anymore, it's time to find something else to do. And your bird come from a long I've ways away. I've been blessed to, up. to shoot a lot of turkeys. I've had some great turkey hunting experiences, and it, it just it don't ever get old. Was this your first Georgia bird? First Georgia bird. Look at that! Sure. Bro. Look at the memories being yeah. made. Yeah. Well, it was a it was a pleasure, and I I appreciate both of y'all. I mean, I, I had a I had a blast. I um, and you singing singing for us around the fire, Mr. Bobby. I mean, that was that was extremely special for me and my team. And well, I thank y'all. It's, it's fun. I, it's I, I thank you for that. And, Mr. Chad, I I know we rag each other, and that's just because Bradley loves you. But um, I, I appreciate all the <laughs> opportunities, all the doors that you open for me and my team and my family, and um, it doesn't go unnoticed or unappreciated. And I appreciate it. I appreciate you, buddy. This place is awesome. Chad, you're like a giving it. soul, buddy. You're always giving to he somebody, is. not just well, me, but our he, friends and people. I, I I see it every day, all the time. And thank you. Well, thank you, buddy, for noticing, and I appreciate you coming. Bradley, thank you. His crew's amazing. If you guys ever get a chance, if you girls ever get a chance, come to South Georgia. Book a hunt with Mossy Pond Outfitters and Hunts. Get your dog trained at Mossy Pond Retrievers. Just stop by and say hello. Visit them. Get to know the family and crew, and then make your mind up. But this place is heaven on earth. You can visit here for three, four days, get a hunt in, get your dog trained, acclimated, and then go down to Disney World if you really want to be in the zoo. I think we're going to do that this summer. This has been another episode of the Foul Life Podcast live from the HQ at Mossy Pond Retrievers and Outfitters in Patterson, Georgia, USA. Today's episode, again, was brought to you by Gerber. Stay sharp, America. Get a knife. Get it now and get that meat off the bone. We're going about to go eat this wild turkey again for the second day in a row. Today's episode was also brought to you by Mossy Pond retrievers and outfitters south georgia thank you all for listening jake tom hit that button this song is called my foul life by the rock band 2am logic <laughs>